Hey, what's going on? And welcome back to the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast. Your host, Thomas Keenan, coming at you today. And I've got the amazing Scott Reeb. This is a gentleman that we're right about on the year mark that I met him. And it was kind of just one of those situations that unfolded. I needed some help. I was in a situation and I went and I was asked to speak at this event in Salt Lake City in August of 2022. And uh, wind up sharing an Uber with this guy and having conversations. And wouldn't you know, he happened to just kind of fit the need of exactly what I needed. It's kind of funny how, you know, God, the universe puts things in front of you when you need it sometimes. Um, here we are a year later. And, you know, I, I work with this guy. We do business together. Excellent individual. And I'm just, I'm grateful to have you on the show, Scott. So welcome, Scott Reeb. You, and let's just, let's just clear the air here. You know, you and I have been working together for a year now. And, you know, your, your specialty is you're an attorney. You've been my business attorney for Step It Up Academy. And That's uh, right. it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, just helping us set up some structure and going through some of the things. You come, you speak at our events and you, you really, in my opinion, you give people a much different model, a different perspective on legal than the traditional Hey, I'm your attorney. Here's your hourly rate. Here's your retainer, wherever it may be. And let me kind of rake you over the coals as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, we try to be different than that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm excited to be able to do it. Um, but yeah, we, we, I mean, for a long time, I was that traditional model, right? Yeah. If you called me, emailed me, did anything, I was going to bill you for those minutes. And I figured out that my clients were making big mistakes because they didn't want to call me and it came down to, they didn't like how I was, how the relationship worked. Uh, and so I hired my first business coach in 2012. Uh, and I had this vision of creating an on-demand subscription model for people just like you, Tom, that, um, you know, legal questions pop up when you're working with clients, uh, when you're doing events, things just come up and you need an avenue to get that information. And so, he helped me build what is called uh, the access plan now. And it's been, uh, it's been, it's been a roller coaster. I mean, you know, a, a 10 year overnight success with it. It didn't take off like I thought it would. Uh, yeah. My goal was a hundred. I thought I'd get a hundred clients in the first year. And mm. I think we ended up with 15. Uh, yeah. So it's been, uh, it's, it's been really fun. It just completely changed my whole life because yeah. I no longer am having to keep track of every minute of my time. I'm not trying to figure out how do I make, more money on each project it's yeah. just i help people I listen to people help them solve problems and and you know we like to help build scale and protect their businesses yeah so one of the cool things is a you've got a team behind you uh one of the pieces of the puzzle though that i like working with you and it, it's it's funny because I, I got an email reminder a couple of days ago i gotta get on your calendar is you know we have pretty much a monthly call hey just check in if there's nothing going on cool but that monthly call is, do you have anything new? Have you created any new intellectual property? Have you created any new uh, products or offerings? Are you hosting a new event? And if so, let you and your team know so we can ensure that the from the legal aspect or legal perspective, you guys are protected in what you're about to go do. And I think that's that's big. Yeah, I, I do. It, it's key. The Our happiest clients do that regularly. Um, mm -hmm. Early on, it was like, man, we had them scheduled like, you were the fifth, you were the third Friday of every month. And I knew I was going to talk to you as we started scaling. I figured out I couldn't do that. And yeah. so now you guys schedule your own calls, but uh -huh. the, um, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're health conscious and you're in the gym all the time and you've got trainers you work with and sure. it's very similar to that. You've got to spend time with people to really understand what are their goals? What are their dreams? What, what are they doing wrong that uh -huh. you just don't know they're doing wrong? And yeah. for me to know that we have to have kind of this ongoing conversation because things will pop up where it's like, you're just doing something that I had no idea. And I go, I can just go, man, that's stupid. Stop doing that. Yes. Do it this way. But if we're not talking, there's no way for us to know. And so yeah. it's, uh, that, that's really kind of been, I think the game changer because I get to be more of a, a business strategist than mm -hmm. just a lawyer. And so we're talking about bigger picture things and then I can come in behind and go, okay, yeah, we need to do this legal document and we need to do it this way to keep you protected, but help you, um, you know, just kind of grow your business in a way that makes sense and then be here as a backstop when something goes wrong. Cause it's, it's just going to, it's going to. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely one of the pieces I picked up on it. And, you know, if, if someone were to ask me, yes, you're my attorney, but I also consider you just, a, a member of the team, but also an advisor slash coach as well. 
because there's, there's been several times on calls where I've said, hey, this is what's going on. These are some of the things that we're offering right now. And you've come along with, well, what's the upsell or what's the downsell or what's the alternative to that? Hey, have you thought about possibly monetizing that model by adding this? And, you know, I don't think that that's something you're going to get from your run of the mill typical attorney who just wants to go and bill you hourly. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And I mean, fortunately for me, m most lawyers don't even know your world exists. They mm -hmm. are so busy looking for big corporate clients that they don't really have time to help people that are they're building these little empires kind of underneath the radar. And yeah. because you know, I kind of my first my kind of my first shot at this stuff was with the Ziegler family. And so mm -hmm. I got I've got to help them for gosh, since 2014 as they tried to carry on Zig's legacy and have to figure out how do we take all that cool stuff that he did and then create new things and do it in new ways. And so I've got I get I've gotten I've I've just learned a ton doing that. And then working with other speakers and coaches, I kind of get to see what everyone's doing. And then I can kind of assimilate it and go, oh, this would work for you. Or let's kind of make a hybrid of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's just, man, it's just a lot of fun, really. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I think it's a great model. All right. So here's, here's some stuff, right? You deal with a lot of different clients, a lot of different industries, verticals, you know, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Across the board, what is the, the most common pain point that you see that people in small business are running into or not doing when it comes to legal? Yeah, there's kind of, let's say there's, there's the big three. The first is they're not using contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing handshake deals or they're doing the only thing worse than no contract. They have these really bad contracts that they've like mm -hmm. downloaded from the internet, combined a couple of things that their buddies were doing and suddenly they think they have this bulletproof contract and they don't there's problems with it and they're not having anyone look at it mm -hmm. uh right and so that's one of the problems we tried to solve with our subscription model is that they're all re all contracts can come to us and get reviewed so you don't make those kind of mistakes the next one that they're making is that they're not sure that they're not sure they own their brand so they've got something that they think is cool they've got this cool name like step it up but they've never taken the time to ensure they have owned that brand and the way you do that is you register it with the United States Patent and Trademark Office as a trademark. Because otherwise, I've seen people get 10 years down the road and they've built a, you know, a seven, almost eight-figure business mm -hmm. in multiple states. And then, then the question comes up, do we, do we have the trademark for that name? Or they get a, a, a letter from someone saying, hey, you've got to stop using your name. It's a cease and desist letter. You've got 30 days to rebrand because we've owned that train bark for the last 12 years. Right. And you basically built your business on their brand that had no uh -huh. idea. Uh -huh. And that's a huge pain point. And then the kind of the third one, and I, you know, I wouldn't really rank these. They're just, they're all important, is, is kind of the structure of their business. Uh -huh. A lot of entrepreneurs don't have any entity. They're just sole practitioners. And you can't do that. That's, uh, yeah. you can't do that. Well, you, you can, <laughs> you can yeah. do it, uh, but yeah, eh, but you're, right. yeah, you're risking everything if you do that, because anything that you take home out of your business and, and, you know, as, as assets and you start creating these things for yourself personally, they're all subject to the liability of your business. So you've got to have at least one entity. And most mm -hmm. of the people I work with, uh, need to have multiple entities. And so, but you have to kind of sit down and we kind of, what I do with a lot of clients is kind of, it's like kind of a dream time. Like if you could do everything that you wanted to, you know, when you're standing in the shower and you are having all these ideas of businesses that you could do in the future, let's map that out. What does that look like? And then I can create a structure that will grow with them so they can do all those things and keep them protected. But most people aren't doing that. If they have one entity, we're lucky. And sometimes they also have done it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they've just, use some legal tool on the internet, filed something with a state, and they think that they have everything they need, and they don't. Mm -hmm. You've got to have some other documentation. For example, uh, you have to have an operating agreement for an LLC. Mm -hmm. It's not like, it's not going to, it's not legally fatal. You can have a business still, but the, it causes real problems in the future. If you ever need to bring someone on as another owner, if you die and someone and multiple owners inherit your business, then how do they run the business? So you've got to have those kind of documents in place. And a lot of people 
have just kind of skipped those steps. It's what Michael Gerber calls the entrepreneurial seizure. You get all excited about what you're doing and you just skip over some of those steps. And yeah. it's just much more expensive to come back later and fix all that stuff. If you'll just take the time to invest up front, mm -hmm. it's much easier. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. And, and you know what would kind of shock me it, realistically, and I probably shouldn't tell you this because you're going to go raise your prices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought that what for for what you're offering, what you're charging versus what you're offering is very fair, right? You're not looking to you know like knock someone over the head, and it's it's a very fair monthly rate where it's like, okay, cool, yeah, I'm not even going to worry about that because I understand that I have an extra layer of protection that is always on call in case something does happen. Oh, and by the way, when these random contracts come over across the year, I get to throw them at your team and say, hey, before I go and sign my life away, could you guys put some eyeballs on this, please? That that alone to me is worth the monthly fee, right? Yeah, that, yeah that's, what, that's what I think. And I've had coaches that I've hired try to convince me to make my fees three times what they are now. And this has been kind of for the conversation. Our plans range from 650 a month to 3,200 a month at the high, very high end. And uh -huh. so I'm like, N no, for a couple of reasons. It's like, I, I want to help real people and real people can't afford $3,000 a month yep. when they're starting out a business. Uh -huh. uh, at some point, I hope they can. And our, you know, my dream is that they scale to a point where they're calling me and saying, Hey, we need to move to your top level. But I, I, I felt like I was going to just kind of miss out on this whole bunch of people that keep mm -hmm. calling me for help. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you can't afford me. Yeah. So I've kept it what we think is reasonable. I mean, it goes, it's gone up over the last 10 years for sure. Sure. Um, the, other pro, the other thing just from a business strategy standpoint is if I lose a client um, at $1,250 a month, okay. If I lose a client at $3,000 a month, that's a person's salary. Yeah. Sure is. And so from a, from a strategy standpoint, I I've chosen to build our membership base where it's a little, the payments are a little smaller per month, but they, you know, they do add up. And if we, if, if someone is unhappy, this is, you know, if you're listening to this, at some point you're going to run into a customer or a client that you cannot make happy. It doesn't matter yep. what you do. And so you got to be ready to, that you lose them. And I've also fired clients where I've just decided, Hey, you're not a good fit for me there'll be people that treat me great personally. And then I find out they're treating my, my team really poorly. And so right. if, the, if they're paying me a really high rate, it's hard to let them go. And so that was also kind of went into Let's, let's keep this to where I can pick who I work with and not feel like I'm, you know, in bondage to them because they're paying us so much money. And so yeah. it's, it's worked pretty well. It makes a lot of sense. You know, it's one of the rules I talk about all the time too. And I had to learn this the hard way years ago is that not all business is good business. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, for sure. Hell, I want to I want to backtrack a second uh, and talk a little bit about the the entity structure. It, yeah. It's one of the things that you do. Like you've come into lots of my events. You've helped a lot of people with that, myself included. You call it bulletproofing your business or something along those lines. But get, let's give um if you can give me an overview of what that looks like. So take a traditional entrepreneur who's got, you know, owns a couple of vehicles, owns a house or two, has the main business. Maybe he's got a rental property in another business. Like, give me an idea of what this structure looks like and the importance of setting up different layers within the entities. Yeah. Yeah. And the kind of our basic philosophy is we call it shatterproofing. And the idea is to build a business that will bend and not break. You know, you got that windshield in your car that, you know, glass, things hit your glass, they mark it. It doesn't come through and hit you in the face. You can keep driving. And so the way you do that is the first thing you want to do, if you're a business owner, whether you're married, single, doesn't matter, have kids. You need to have a, a living trust at the very top of your business structure that owns everything that you do uh -huh. so that if there's ever a problem and you become incapacitated, then there's a trustee that can step up with authority and make, make sure payrolls made, make sure all this stuff happens in your business while you get better, hopefully. Or if, or if you pass away, then there's someone that can transition your business to, to another person. It can be really bad. I'm working with a family right now in that situation where they hadn't done some of this planning and they're having to use the power of attorney and mm -hmm. banks aren't taking it. There's some real problems with it. So you want to have that trust at the top. The next thing that we teach all of our members to, to think about doing is have what I call a family holding company. If you're an individual, it could be a personal holding company, mm -hmm. but this is the LLC that's between your trust and everything else you do. 
And we usually form those in states like Wyoming, Nevada, or Delaware. They have really strong, it's what, you know, it's kind of getting technical, but it's called charging order protection. And what it does is it protects your businesses from you personally, right? Uh-huh. Cause we all drive up these huge vehicles around. And if you happen to run over a brain surgeon in their prime of life, create a $10 million liability, you were negligent, you lose. And they get uh-huh. this huge judgment against you personally. Well, in those States, they cannot seize your LLC interests. They're stuck with this thing called a charging order where they, they're entitled to the distribution of profits. Yep. Got it. We can all just, distrib- we can find many ways to get money out of that business without distributing profits through that business. And so they get starved out. So you've protected it from that direction. And then you want to have silos underneath that holding company for all the other things that, that we do. Like if you're a coaching company, you would have your coaching company as an LLC under there. And then you might also uh, do speaking and we could have a separate company that does all the speaking events. So if somehow you created a liability while you're speaking, it doesn't affect your coaching. Yeah. A lot of our clients who are creating lots of intellectual property will put another LLC there that is, just holds the trademarks, the copyrights, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so you can kind of see that you keep having these silos. And so the next one would be, hey, we're going to have a real estate empire, right? So now we're going to create another one, probably use a series LLC there that holds each property because every property should be in its own LLC. And so this thing just starts kind of spidering out, yeah. but it all flows up through that family holding company where you can hold money in a safe way because no one can get to it. And then you distribute it through your trust. And it's, it's just as if you're getting paid personally that yeah. uses your social security number. So that there's not an extra tax return. You're covered. Yep. Yeah. Got it. So, I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. The, but the, it's the other thing that you get is anonymity with that. If you're mm-hmm. using that holding company in those States we're talking about, you get that bilateral protection and then those silos. And so that's kind of, that's the overall, thing that we do i also Mm -hmm. tell everyone that that i think that you should crawl walk and run so if you're a new business owner uh, even if you're having some success if you're in year one we don't do all that stuff that's too much for you to try to manage but Mm -hmm. year two we might add one layer year three another layer and by the time you get to year five you should be able to manage that because you'll now have a team set up you'll have a maybe a contract cfo that can help you manage the cash flow and so those are, those are things that you just got to be careful because you'll see a lot of legal uh, gurus on YouTube, for instance, that talk about these really complicated asset protection schemes. And then people will call me and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And it's like, you, you're not ready for that. Yeah. And if you go do that, you could really create a bunch of headaches for yourself that could be expensive to unwind. Yeah. Because like here, here's a piece of the puzzle that I think a lot of people probably don't think or realize, right? A, each of those is going to need some tax work done. Each of yeah. those is going to need bookkeeping and accounting. And granted, there may yeah. not be a lot of stuff that's running through some of those entities. It's that more, more for protection. But right. someone still has to go and file all that paperwork. Someone's still got to manage and say, hey, from a cash flow perspective, this is how we get everything to trickle up to the top so the owners can actually make some money. Right. And in my opinion, right, not, not only do you need your team to help out with the structure there, but the the financial team, the the, the CFO, yes. the fractional CFO, the CPAs, yep. whoever they are, they have to be on board with this plan as well and also understand it and say, oh, okay, I understand what's going on here. Now this makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And so we do uh, we do this, il- this illustration called the Shatterproof illustration. And then they we send that to the CPA. And then we'll often do a conference, like a, a Zoom meeting or something with them if they have questions, because the most important thing isn't protection. I mean, it's very important. But the most important thing is that you keep as much of your money as possible. We can find other ways to protect things. And so I want to make sure that it's running from in a tax efficient way because I always I only play a tax lawyer on TV. I I know enough to be really dangerous. So we we always work closely with those financial people and we can do that in the background. Right. You can go do your thing and we can have a meeting in the background, work out all the details and then tell you, hey, this is decided you should do. Yeah. Got it. I definitely think it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the new people for sure, because you, you're going no. to need a team to help manage it. Uh, and one, one of the one of the objections that you probably get hit with occasionally is like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. It's too complicated. Yep. Right. So what, what happens when you've got a client who's got a lot of stuff going on, they're successful, they've got a bunch of different entities, and they're like, nope, too complicated. I want one entity. I want to keep it simple. 
Like, what, what do you do at that point in time? Is it someone who's a, if, if that person's kicking that kind of feedback to you, are they not a good fit for you and your firm? Or is it, Hey, let me help educate this person and show them that it's not so terrible. A, a little of both. Uh, that's, that's where I start telling a lot of stories, you know, for instance, <laughs> The story that I would tell that person is that we have a client and they've given me permission to talk about it that ran a bunch of subway franchises, seven or eight of them. They owned about half of the buildings they were in, at least the rest of them, and they were running all of it out of one ink, one corporation. And they were kind of, it was all kind of in a local region. And so they had a driver that would go store to store to store and get deposits, right? Because it was a cash business, a lot of it, and take mm -hmm. that to the bank. Well, on the way to one of the one of the bank runs, uh, the driver ha fell asleep at the wheel, head on collision, and everyone died. And so they have this huge lawsuit. Uh, it went on for a couple of years. They eventually uh, had to pull money out of their retirement accounts to add to the insurance because there wasn't enough insurance to settle the case to wow. get rid of it. And we and then we then we built this really the structure we've been talking about. It was uh -huh. built and just waiting for them to get out of that lawsuit so they could do it. This was in 2008, 2009. So the economy was horrible. They really needed to refinance some things, but couldn't because of litigation and everything was tied in one basket. And that yeah. story will often have the effect of, okay, I can do a little more complication. Yeah. Um, yeah but it, at some point, you know, the client's always right. And so at some point, if they're just insistent, then you know we write a letter and say hey we've we've advised you to do this structure you've chosen to do this structure and then we just move on and hopefully everything's okay again yeah. you're if you have one entity you're better than having none and so yeah. yeah it does happen and usually those people it's because they went too fat too fast yeah and uh, and and or they don't have a, the right team in place to manage it mm. and so then they get really frustrated yeah Let's uh, let's shift gears here for a minute. Let's talk about some employee or contractor horror stories. Okay. Um, I know, you, know, you shared some stuff with me that you've helped clients with in the past, and, and you probably got some new stuff since we had those conversations. But give me give me some examples of the importance of because a lot of people will play the game, and they'll be like, I can get by, and I can kind of you know skirt around the edges. I'll bring this person on as a contractor. Meanwhile, that person technically should be an employee. Right. And, and there's a lot of differences there. If people want to go, they can Google it and see the, the pros and cons and the, the list of, you know, if, if you're doing X, Y, and Z, they really should be an employee versus a contractor. But what happens when you have that person on as a contractor and shit goes sideways and they should have been an employee? Yeah. So it depends on, I mean, there's, there's two ways that can go really wrong. Mm -hmm. One is that let's say you're in the construction business. I see this a lot in the construction business. If someone gets hurt on the job really hurt, you know, not just like a broken finger or toe. They, they're really hurt, catastrophic yeah. type injury. And they were, you had them as a 1099. Well, your workers' comp insurance may not cover that. And your, it's also possible that your general liability insurance may not cover that. And so you could have someone with a million dollars in medical bills that is hurt because they were working for you no, and no fault of their own. And you'd have no way of making that right. So they sue you and you end up having to go file bankruptcy because they win and get this judgment against you, your company. Then it triggers a lot of things like you might have had a letter, a, a line of credit with a bank. But if you bankrupt the company, now they're going to come after you for it. So then you end up having to file personal bankruptcy. So uh -huh. that that part's a big issue. And another thing I've seen quite a bit is that, you know, we're going to bring these crews on, uh, call them, make them sign these contractor agreements. And then the one of them leaves and they get audited <clears throat> and oh. they tell somebody that they're they, you know, kind of what they did. And and either the Texas Workforce Commission or the IRS says, oh, you sound like it, that you're an employee. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. There's like this 20 factor test that the IRS publishes it says that they publish. Well, it doesn't really you can't like if you go through those and you win 10 out of the 20. It doesn't matter. Uh, I've, I've, I've talked to CPAs and people that, and tax attorneys that fight these, try to fight all these things. And mm -hmm. I've, I've never heard of a single time that, that a person or an employer has won that argument. The IRS wins it every time. Mm -hmm. So 
it's really important that if you're going to classify someone as a contractor, that not only are you sure that your mm-hmm. lawyer's sure your CPA sure everyone's in agreement that this person is a contractor because yeah. you're on the hook for mm-hmm. your side of the tax as the employer, the employee yeah. side of the tax, the penalties interest. And because it's payroll tax, you can't bankrupt out of it. So uh-huh. say it's gone on a couple of years and you've got a big crew ends up with this hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar liability. We're back in the same spot where you end up insolvent uh, and they're coming after you personally for it. Yeah. And you can't file bankruptcy. So uh-huh. it's like everyone acts everyone is very cavalier with this, but I probably should put it in the, I need to have four hot issues now because it's <laughs> it really is huge and we've all done it. When sure. you're starting out and things are lean, we've all done it. But it, it just, there's many benefits to having employees. And so if they're not truly a vendor, if they're, if they're someone that you're asking to, you really would like them to be there at a certain time and you want to do it a certain way, then make them an employee. So you can control that. You can have non-competes in most States. Um, there's lots of benefits to that and they can't ever sue you. I mean, we're in Texas, so it's a, it's a right to work. I mean, we can fire someone for wearing the wrong color t-shirt. So yeah. there's no, there's no a right to get paid for the rest of a year. For example, if you terminate them, uh, not because they did anything wrong, or maybe you don't have the documentation for it. You just want them out, right? Uh-huh. They're just a bad seed and you want them out. You can let them go. They don't have any, they can't come sue you for wrongful termination. They're not going to win that. Unless yeah. they happen to be one, you know, a class of citizen that, you know, by race, religion, age, you know, you can't uh-huh. make those mistakes. But otherwise, you can let them go. But if they're a contractor, then they're going to have either an they're going to have either a written contract or an oral contract that you told them that they're going to get paid this much, and they may have a claim to get paid even though you've gotten rid of them. So yeah. it's it's uh, it can be a real quagmire. So you just mm. you got to be really careful. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a real world example. Many years ago, one of my companies, we had uh, brought a guy on and he was a contractor, but he really wasn't. He was really an employee, but he was, he was a contractor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just full transparency here. So we got this guy on, he's a contractor and uh, things, he, he's just not performing the way he should. Right. So yep. we fire him. Hey man, it's not going too good anymore. You, you got to go. It's always always fun letting someone go. I'm being funny here. Not really. Yeah. Uh, so it's a terrible conversation. Like you feel bad about it. This guy goes, he's a young kid. He's just, he's kind of, he's kind of twisted up and messed up. You know, his life's going a little bit of a, a different direction than it should be, my opinion. Cut the guy. And we were in New York State at the time. And this this dude goes and files unemployment. Yep. With New York State. New York State reviews all of his stuff. They they contact us, and this is, I don't know how many years ago at this point. Hopefully, they've changed this. But at the time, New York State was reco- – the only way that you could reply back to this questionnaire and give your statement was via fax. <laughs> he had to submit – he couldn't send an email. You know, God forbid. No. Uh, he had to send a fax. So <laughs> even that was troublesome. But what wound up happening was the state came back after interviewing him and having a couple of calls with us and said, well, this gentleman's an employee. Therefore you owe X, Y, and Z. Boom. Here it is. That also triggered a workman's comp audit. How you get workman's it? comp audit came back around and looked over everything and said, okay, cool. You owe us another $17,000. Yep. So <laughs> here you are thinking you're saving a couple bucks by, you know, paying someone as a contractor versus an employee. And all said and done, it cost, I don't know, 22, 23, $24,000 plus a bunch of time to go yeah. through all that BS. So at that point, could we have just paid this guy a couple more dollars a week out of, you know, what it would have uh, cost for FICA and, and be, being an employee? Yep. Yes. And it would have eliminated all of that BS and stress completely. Yeah. And it's, and, and, and it's another one of those things that if you start up front, so when you hire your first person, if you put them on payroll and you kind of get used to it. If you have to bring, let's say, 10 people on to payroll that are misclassified, that's painful. Yeah. Right. But if you do it a little at a time, you, you'll you notice the first one. And then it's just no big deal. And it's just it's just a part of life and you go on. 
but if you get used to doing it to having these independent contractors and then you get caught once and have to shift everyone over not yeah. only is the like, like having to settle the other case for twenty four thousand or whatever then you're having to put everyone on payroll and suddenly your payroll goes up 25 yeah. percent it's uh yeah. it can be a, a real mess another problem you can run into is if you're paying someone's a contractor and they work 45 hours well you do, you don't pay them overtime and so if if they ever get reclassified by the government they can then also have a Fair Labor Standards Act claim for not paying them overtime. Uh, right. and, and once one person, once the, once they get one, because there's lawyers out there that are just trolls, they're looking for this stuff. Yeah. And then so they say, oh, you work for this company? And then they start trying to reach out on social media and things to people that work there. And you find out, oh, yeah, I haven't, got, I haven't been paid right either. And then suddenly you've got a bunch of people making these wage claims. And yeah. it's so... Uh, the, it's just not worth it. You just yeah. make them employees. It should be rare that you're using 1099s. A lot of people will use it wrong where maybe you've got a busy season and so you're bringing on extra people and so you make them contractors. Well, that's called a seasonal employee, not an independent contractor. And so they would just come and go, but they're still W-2 and they'll, they get a paycheck and you hold out the taxes. But it's just a part. It's just a part of this business game. Is you have to have payroll tax. Um, you and I both use some of the same vendors, because we're both go high level guys. And so you have to have. You need to do it right. I think you need a consultant that's doing that stuff in the background. And so you know that's a, that's a that's a true independent contractor. You know they have their own company. You're in a contract with a, a LLC, not a person. And that's where those are the independent contractors, not the individuals. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Let me, so, all right, you, you do a bunch of different things in the legal uh, space. You know, we'll, we'll wrap coaching into that. We'll wrap, we'll, you do a lot of public speaking and events as well. Uh, and of all of the stuff that you do, like what makes you tick? What makes you get up and, you know, in the morning and say, oh, I actually want to go do some cool stuff at work today? Yeah, I, I love doing the monthly calls that you mentioned that I love doing that. And then, getting in front of on a stage then like you've let me do so many times that that really lights me up yeah. because I, I there's still people one-to-one -one, I'm just so limited on time I mean I can only do about 20 calls a week that's just about yeah. all I can do but if I can get in front of a couple hundred people and and make them aware of some of these issues that you and I just talked about then whether they have me fix them or not that's okay but now sure. they're aware of it and they may go back and get someone else to fix it. And then I feel like I've done my job. And so mm -hmm. that I just, I just love doing that. I love, uh, I like teaching. And so yeah. it just, I, it just lights me up. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, real similar to me too. It's like, Hey, I'm going to give you some information here. And if you want to go self implement, cool. If you want to hire us to help you out, cool. If you want to go hire someone else to help you out, cool. As long as you take this information and it sparked a little something in you and you actually go and do something with it. That to me is most important uh, over all of it. Yeah. And it is fun when people reach out to you six months after an event and say, Hey, I saw you here and you made a lot of sense. I'd like you to help me. Yeah. And yeah. In, in many ways, that's almost more fun than the person that walks to the back of the room and says, I want to hire you now. It's yeah. like, Oh wow. So I, I really had some impact that lasted with you for six months mm -hmm. and now you're in a place where you can work with me. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty great. Yeah, it is good. It's 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 literally why I do what I do, and I'm picking up that it's a lot of the reason why you do what you do. Uh, I'll give yeah. a quick story here, quick, a quick win that I had this week, right? And it wasn't a it wasn't a financial win for me at all, uh, but it was really cool. So about a year and a half ago, for those of you who are listening to this, if you and I'll, I'll tell people where they can find it because maybe they'll they'll go to this link and book it. <laughs> yeah. I have a, I've got like a link tree style landing page. And it's on a custom URL to connect with thomas.com. And yep. on that, and it's, it's, that's the website that's listed in all of my social media profiles, right? Because now you click to this one site and it lists out, hey, these are all the places you can find me on the socials. This is the website. This is my contact information. All of it's in one spot. Yep. On there also happens to be a link to book a one hour call with me, paid call. So this guy's been following my content in the background. I've never spoken to him, never looked at him, nothing. And he's, he's a chiropractor in the DFW area. Okay. So I'm going about my day and I get a notification on my phone. Boop. 
So and so just paid you twenty five hundred bucks for a one hour call. What the hell is this? Okay. I'll take it though. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. So the guy paid. Um, I go now. I know who he is. I go. I do a little social recon. Follow him on the social medias and Instagram, the whole nine yards, and kind of get a, a, a backstory of who this guy is and, and what he does. All right. Cool. Guy's active over there. Uh, like like us, takes good care of himself. Seems to be wanting to do more better things for himself as far as business uh, and personal mm-hmm. fitness mindset, all of it. All right, my kind of people. Get on a call with this guy. And you know when you work with the person who's just very, they're tuned in, like they're there for a purpose. They're not there just to waste your time, right? Yeah. That's this guy. He comes ready. He comes with his note, his notepad, his pen. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this is exactly what I need to get out of this call today. Like he laid it out. Oh, even better. So now we yep. have something to focus on. So, all right, get to know him for a couple minutes. Uh, all right, this is what you need to do. And I gave him the game plan of how to get there. So this is where you are now. Here's the goal that you're at. And, and it, it was basically operational structure that he was missing in his company. Yeah. Okay. I told him exactly what to do, what to implement. I even suggested a couple of different softwares for him to go and check out. Um, so he can, he can start building this stuff. And this week, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday. I get a DM from this guy on Instagram and he sends me over a screenshot of his bank account and mm-hmm. it's two, two photographs, one of them with a balance of a thousand dollars and like a thousand thirty seven and change, right? Like we're not talking a lot of money in a business account there. Mm-hmm. And the next photograph is the same account a year later with a hundred thousand plus dollar bonus, uh, uh, balance in it. And he writes a couple paragraphs and was like, hey, um, just one, I think you should know this. Uh, that photograph there was right around the time that I booked the call with you. He goes, I pretty much rolled my last dollar into getting on a call with you. So I put on a credit card. I, I didn't have the money to pay for it. He goes, I was about three weeks away from closing the doors on my practice. Wow. And he goes, I literally took everything that you gave me and broke it down step by step and started to implement it. And I did. And here's the balance from this week. So thank you. Here's the win. I like made my week, literally yeah. made the week. So, you know, if, if, if doing like what you do and, and what I do and, and it, it, the way we do things is so parallel, I guess you have your specialty over in the legal aspect of things. And I have my specialty in the operations area. But they, they run parallel to each other. And at the end of the day, what I love about you, and I think one of the reasons that we get along so damn well, is that we just want to help other people do well. Yep. So I love it. Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. What's next for you? What's what, what projects you have going on? What are you trying to do with the company? Who else are you trying to help? Yeah, so r- right now we're finishing up uh, the book. My mm-hmm. first book, real book. I've had a couple mini books, but it's called The Shatterproof Entrepreneur. I'm uh, hoping to have it out by November, a time for your next event. And uh, so that's kind of the the big thing right now, to doing photo shoots to get the cover done. And it's exciting. I, I don't uh, I don't like to write. I mean, you've got a couple books, and we don't do these books because we li- like to do I don't them. like to write either. I tell uh, people all the time, they're like, really? You don't like yeah. to write? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> It's another way for me to get this message in front of hopefully thousands of people uh, so that they can start making some, there's some changes in their lot in their life and business. And it's uh, it really kind of walks you through this, what I call the six phases of a shatterproof business. And you know, it's not all legal stuff. Uh, some of it, you know, kind of veers into your lane a little bit with some operations. And we talk a lot about mission, you know, mission, vision, core values and all of that stuff. And so I'm, I'm super excited to get that out and then yeah. be able to take that on the road. Yeah, that's that's a big deal right there. You know, and people told me it was a big deal when I was going through the process and getting ready to do it. Like, yeah, 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 cool. And you've got your head down. And you're just so damn busy doing the work and going through all the edits and back and forth, which is almost relentless. And um, I'll never forget. It's like th- my book launched in June of 2019. And not even two weeks later, my phone rings and it's the person I had been chasing for two years asking to get on their stage, called me and gave me the opportunity. Right. And like, I think it's, it's awesome for you because you, you're already, um, 
an accomplished speaker. You, you, you go to countless events and you speak on stages, which is great. I think this right here is literally just going to amplify what you're able to do. The amount of people you get in front of, you know, the, the, when you, some of the stats that I looked up on this couple of years ago just blew my mind. And, and I don't know if this is still true. Google will tell you. So those of you who are listening, please go Google it and figure it out just like I did. I think it's something like 0.01% or less of the population is a published author. Wow. And when I say published author, I'm not just talking books. I'm talking like blogs and magazine articles as well. Right. Wow. So you join such an elite club the minute that that book goes live and you, you say, hey, I'm, I'm a published author at this point. Yeah. So it's a it's a real That's small cool. little fraternity. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm man, I'm so close. I can't wait to, yeah. to get there because I had the outline for the book for, well, before COVID. Yeah. So over three years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's exciting. I can't wait to see the to, it's like because if you haven't ever written a book, you kind of write it in pieces and yeah. not and they're not in the order of the way the book would go <laughs> and so it's it's even hard for me to kind of totally picture what it's actually going to be yeah. uh so yeah it's yeah i'm pretty excited about it yeah it's good yeah same same with me it was you know little pieces here and there and then i i couldn't work on it even when the the order of the book we were going through the final edits even when the the order of the book was getting you know drilled down everything was lined up chapters where they were it had to be stories were in the right order. As I was going through it, I got to points where I was like, I just don't want to work on that portion of the story right now. And I would have to go find another one that I, I'd go work on. And I, right. it's one of those things where you kind of just got to chip away at it little by little. And um, one day finally it gets done. But I, I'll never forget, uh, I submitted, I think it was a third or the fourth round of edits I went through and sent it in. And at this point it was pretty close but this Word document still had all of the corrections on it. The margins were filled up with comments. Like it was, it was a monster document, yep. right? It gave me anxiety and agita every time I just opened and looked at it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I remember sending it off and being like, all right, I think, I think I, I finally got my section of the edits done. A couple of days go by and I woke up and uh, I remember I was living in New York at the time, woke up. And for some reason, like I'm not one to sit in bed after I wake up. I usually I'm up, I'm out of the bed doing my thing. Yeah. I got up, too. I sat up in the bed and kind of like, you know, rested my, my, my big giant grizzly back against the headboard. And I had this feeling that I should just pick up my phone and look at it. Like, okay. So this is not th that abnormal. Reach over, unplug the damn phone from the charger and, and open it up. And boom, there's an email from the editor. And it's like, hey, here's, here's your final take a look and let me know if you need any changes. And it was a Saturday morning. Uh, it was a little bit late. My kids already were up and, and uh, Jen had taken care of the kids. So I sat up and I literally read the entire book page by page. And, you know, at this point, you know this too, you've read this thing so many times that you can get through it much quicker than the average reader because you, you just, you just do. And I remember going through it in about an hour and a half, two hours, I ripped through the book and I saw like two or three small things that I wanted to correct. But beyond that, the thing was like, it was, it was, it was looking good. And it just amazed me how it went from this complete chaotic monster that I had sent over. And then when they handed it back to me, it was this polished thing that actually made me sound halfway intelligent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More than halfway intelligent. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Awesome. My next personal thing is I'm taking my wife to London in October. Uh, it's kind of our 32nd anniversary uh, trip. And so I, we've never traveled overseas. So it's we're looking forward to that. Yeah, I've never been that way either. And the older I get, the more called I get to go to that area of the world. Yeah, I like so, it. Yeah, that's kind of what's so, going on with me. Uh, one of the things that I want to do here, and, and remind me, I'm sure we're going to have multiple phone calls before then. But when it comes time to the book launch, what we'll do is we'll just, we're going to recycle this episode too and get it live. That way, you know, you can get in front of more people and, and hopefully it'll help right. your launch out as well. Yeah. I'll awesome. definitely remind you. Yeah. And I'm sure my, good. my book editor will as well. You probably, probably we can make that happen. <laughs> um, with that being said, Scott, what's the best place where people connect with you if they want to learn more about you, the book, and maybe get you to speak on their stage. Yeah, the best way is when we go to our website, which is reblaw.com, R-E-I-B-L-A-W.com forward slash step it up. 
And if you go to that page, we have a page set up just for this show. You can actually book a 20 minute call with me. It's called a, a, a 20 minute game plan session. And I uh, won't sell you anything. Just want to talk to you, see if we can help you. And then you can also download uh, a free uh, PDF ebook um, on five strategies to shatterproof your business. Um, and I just, Hey, thanks for having me on the show and everyone go to that. And that's a best way. If you want some more legal tips, go to at the Scott Reeb on Instagram and we release about six reels a week with new content so that you can build, grow and scale your business. Yeah. I'm always seeing you guys active over there. I love it. Hey, I appreciate you coming in here today, sharing some great knowledge with us and the guests and everyone who's going to listen to this in the future. And uh, just know that I truly appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast. Make sure you head over to stepitupentrepreneur.com and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode of the Step It Up Entrepreneur Podcast.